This is the Sonata Chronicles Era's End graphic novel audio outline read, read by William L. Brown, MBA of Striking the Water Productions, LLC for the Era's End Kickstarter. Page one. A lone rider looks down on a village that lies below the crest of the dune her wagon bee stands on at the edge of a sea of sand. The village is comprised of old stone hovels like small closets standing above the dusty, sun-baked clay. The setting sun casts long, violet shadows from the ambient blue light filling in the darkness over the red landscape. Each of the structures is made of red brick. They are all gathered around a single public meeting area in the village center. The hovels are standing doorways with angled backs hinting at the stairwells inside that lead down to the subterranean settlement below. Underground metropolises like these were once very popular before the Emperor Constant built his massive empire that now spans the world, a disembodied voice says to the Lone Rider. I've never seen this place before, the Lone Rider says as she turns the wagon beast to move on. You must go down there and investigate, the disembodied voice says. The damage of time is evident in the blowing grains of sand from nearby dunes and the crumbling structures of the village. Everything is old and worn except the burned out fires near the village center and the broken wagons of a wandering tribe that tried to make camp here. The tribe's members and their animals' bones are held in their linen clothes and leather armor. Although their bodies are stripped to what resembles polished bone, the fires are no more than a day or two old. Page 2 on the crest of a dune above the village sits our heroine Nuha, on the back of a tusked beast, looking out over the scene from her saddle. Why must I go investigate, she asks. It's obvious that whoever did this is long gone, and there's the chance that I might be discovered down there. Nuha wears an off-white linen hooded robe that conceals her face and is held in place by a leather corset around her abdomen. The corset is more made for protection than it is for fashion. Her leather gloves sport steel plates on the back of her hands, and steel bracers peek out from under the loose sleeves of her robes, sleeves like those of a medieval monk's religious habit. You must go down there and investigate. Whoever did this may be a threat to others, and they cannot be allowed to go free, says the disembodied voice. The beast Noha sits on looks like a cross between a camel, an ox, and an elephant with aqua skin and patches of brown fur. Her riding reins are tied to its elephant-like tusks, as is considered traditional, and Nuha straddles the beast just behind its neck and in front of its camel-like hump. The creature is called a tavor, or wagon beast, and is the centerpiece of wanderer culture. If I go down there and I'm discovered, all of the Empire will be hunting me. My safety relies in anonymity, Nuha says as she looks around for anyone who may be observing the strange situation. The disembodied voice replies, If you do not go down there, you will be abandoning your birthright. Nuha sighs as she realizes that the disembodied voice has a point. She pulls the reins of the beast, pointing it toward the village, and they both meander through the standing doors on their way to the center of the village as both Ryder and Mount look down the paths that criss and cross between the hovels. Page 3. Nuha and her beast arrive at the scene of the massacre. She pulls her scythe from her back as she dismounts her tavor. The weapon has inlay of gold-like substance that has run down the flat of the blade which is crafted from obsidian. She holds it off to her side as she listens to the disembodied voice. Underground settlements like these were very popular before Emperor Constant amassed his empire. Then the people that once called themselves settlers moved into his metropolises and changed their name to city people. Nuha asks, Is it true that those cities are made from the corpses of sand spirits? The disembodied voice answers, and that discovery was what caused the rift between the settlers and the wandering tribes, and it changed the face of the world forever. Nuha walks through the wreckage and the broken benches and the old coal stoves that have given away to erosion. As she meanders through the devastation, her blue eyes scan over the details around her. They almost glow from under the shade provided by her hood. 
This wandering tribe looks as though it had been killed ages ago. How can you be certain we can still track down their killers, she says. The disembodied voice says, The pits for those fires are still black and have not yet been filled in with sand from the blowing winds coming over the dunes. I imagine that some other force stripped the flesh away from their bones. Her wagon beast nudges her with its tusk like a needy horse would do to its rider when it senses danger. She leads it by the reins and ignores its calls for the most part. What could have wiped out a whole tribe of desert people? She asks. The wanderers are known to be fearsome warriors out among the dunes. Just then, Nuha turns to discover an enormous broken stone axe buried in the wreckage of one of the wandering tribe's wagons. The blade has smashed all the way through the bottom of the wagon, and the handle has broken off from the force of the impact. Kolke Erod, the disembodied voice says. I thought they were extinct, Nuha says as she reacts to the news. The disembodied voice continues. If lack of evidence were proof positive of extinction, then there would be no Obermersheb like you left. I imagine that the bear men have just been hiding in the mountains away from prying eyes. Nuha asks the disembodied voice again. But what would they be doing here so far away from the mountains they call home? Just then, our heroine turns to try to find the source of a growing rumble under the ground around her. 